he, but I had a really high IQ and stuff. I thought, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, but the cool thing is, is you don't have to be older or stronger or more athletic. I mean, we said this morning, Bailey, she's not going to dunk a ball in the NBA. It's just not in her genes. It's just not. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't matter. You, you, we're all limited in some way. Maybe you're not going to be as tall as people. Maybe you're going to be as big as people. But here's the thing. God says everybody has the chance to mature in their faith. They do. Matter of fact, uh, yesterday I got to, I got to go to, to Brother Jacob's funeral. And I, I looked at this man in, in the casket, and I saw the pictures, and he was a, kind of a shorter, statured man. I remember going and visiting him, and he was this, just a neat, neat person. And he would say, oh, I'm not that smart. I'm not that special, but God used me. See, God uses all of us. And you can grow. And matter of fact, here, here's something. You can actually grow in faith even stronger than your parents. See, you can never be older than your parents physically, but you can grow in faith and be stronger even than your parents. There's, there, there may be a day that your parents go, I don't understand what the Word says about this, and you can actually tell them. There's no limitations. Matter of fact, the one person in my life that I would consider a giant in his faith is Michael. And he's watching me right now because he can't go to church. Michael was born with cerebral palsy, and he can't walk on his own. He can, he can do very little on his own, but he loves Jesus more than anybody I know. He knows the Scripture more than anybody I know. He listens to, to sermons. He reads his Bible, and he always, always, always is smiling. If anyone had a reason to be angry or whatever, it could, it could be Michael, but Michael loves Jesus. matter of fact, when I was pastor, and he came to me and said, Brother Danny, the last two pastors said I didn't have to be baptized, but I want to tell everyone how much I love Jesus. Would you baptize me? I said, Michael, we're going to baptize you. And they had to hand him to me in the baptistry. And I stood before people, and I there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Everybody's crying because and he had not been submerged, and he'd never gone underwater with his with his abilities, but. We went all the way down in the water and came up, and he just hugged me, and he was so proud to let others know. And to this day, if you go to his Facebook page, it's a picture of him being baptized. He is that passionate about anyone knowing who Jesus is. He doesn't have a master's degree. He doesn't have a lot to show, but he is a giant in the faith because he loves Jesus. And you can too. There's nothing standing between you and a personal, serious relationship with Jesus. And, and I love in, in 1 Corinthians, actually Paul calls out some older people. He looks at some of the, 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 the people in his, in his crowd and says, I wish I could speak to you as spiritual people, but in the flesh you are babies in Christ. Ooh. He called some older people babies. Now, when I was, when I was growing up, them were fighting words. I had three older sisters, and they would call me the baby, and I would get so mad. And before long, I like, thought, Mom, they're calling me a baby, and they don't call your brother a baby. So you know what they would do? They would say, Danny is a... And they would just smile. I'd go, they're doing it again. <laughs> don't call... And they're like, well, they didn't say the word baby. But I knew what they were thinking. But Paul looks at some adults and says, I wish I could refer to you as an adult, but you know what? You're still a baby. You're still eating this food. And I need you to get in God's Word. I need you to love me. I need you to be all in. Good, better, best. I need you to be best. I need you to be all in for me. And then you can become a giant of faith. You don't have to be super smart or athletic or big. You just need to be all in and love the lover of your soul. So that's what we're, going to do, what we're going to talk about today, and I pray that God can grow each of you. I want to come back and, and, and see, see you years later. Matter of fact, today, today in the little church that I preached at was a young man that sat just like this, like you are in my children's sermons, and today he's standing before a congregation 
preaching the word of God. And I've heard the word, he is wise beyond his years. He is bringing the word with power to people who were old enough to be his grandparents. You're only limited by your, what you do with what God has given you. So let's pray and ask God to grow us up in him and to find our purpose in him. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, help us stop being babies in Christ. Help us get in your word and love on you, the lover of our souls. Father, not that we may be, be bragful about being giants, because I know Michael's one, I'm not a giant. I know C. E. Jacobs will say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not a giant. But, Father, that you would use each of us in a small way is what we're hoping for. We're hoping that you would look at us and smile and say, that's my boy. That's my girl. You're growing up, and I love to see your growth. Father, help us grow in our faith and grow closer to you. I love you, Jesus. In your most holy and precious name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Miss Chris was going to take y'all to children's. Stand again with us this morning as we uh, sing a couple more praises to God. Um, I want to read Romans, uh, the last part of Romans 11 and the first verse of Romans 1. Uh, I didn't give Tammy anything but uh, the first verse of Romans 12, but. Um, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then in Romans 12, it starts out, Therefore, in light of all of this that God's done, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And in light of everything that God's done for us and everything that he's given us and the weather outside and, and the ability that we have to just fellowship together and be together is just one of those many, many things. All that we do, all that we do is for his glory is to, to try to pay him back, even though it says, who, can, who has God ever, who's ever given to God that he should repay him? We can't ever give God anything that he has to pay us back for. But he gives us a chance to give to him. So if you would like to give to Pleasant Hill, what we do with that money is like, we, we run the lights and we do all the things that uh, reach ministry, like Upward and the lunches and, and you know, renting the place to, to play softball today. All that things, all those things comes from your all's giving. Um, so if you would like to give, you can give online at phbcsummerset.com slash giving. Uh, or there are boxes in the back, back here next to this uh, door. And there are some in the Welcome Center. Um, but as we sing Blessed Assurance... That's another one of those things that he's given us that we can never pay him back for, is the assurance that we have in Christ. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, I'd a foretaste of glory divine. of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. 
just pray that as Corey comes and brings this message about maturity, that you would ingrain it into our hearts, that, that we would look forward uh, to being like Christ, to being to the full stature of Christ in maturity. Um, God, I just thank you for everything. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Devin. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. If you want to have your Bibles ready, I am going to finish the series today, Your Part Matters, and I want to talk about how we grow in maturity. You know, when I think about my life so far in Christ, I got saved at the age of 17 and uh, came to know the Lord and walked with the Lord and got plugged into a church family and became active in a church body serving. I look back at my experience and I realize now that many churches offer a menu. And what they say is we've got these worship services, we've got these Bible studies, we've got these groups, we've got these uh, ministries. 
You need to get involved. Pick one. Well, which one? Well, they're all good, so pick as many as you want, you know? And we, we take a menu approach when it comes to spiritual maturity. And I think what we're going to have to do as a church moving forward is have a map mentality. Not a menu where you pick and choose things, but a map that says, where are we going and how do we get there? You see, I think we have mistaken spiritual maturity from church commitment. Let me let that sink in for a minute. Just because you're always here, and praise God for that, that doesn't automatically turn into spiritual maturity. See, the Great Commission is about reaching people for Jesus and then learning to obey everything he's commanded us. And that part is the spiritual maturity, the learning to obey him and everything he's commanded us. And I think so many times we're content with a menu mindset where as long as people are picking and choosing the things we offer, then they're okay. They'll be fine. They will grow in their salvation. They'll become a mature Christian but here's what I do know. Maybe you've heard of George Barna. George Barna has spent his life researching trends in American Christianity. You can go to barna.org and you can see that he's been doing this for decades, for a very long time. And of all people in our country, he's probably the expert when it comes to what goes on in American Christianity right here in the United States of America. And a few years ago, he, he wrote a book, and I didn't realize this, I'm kind of behind, but I'm going to be catching up soon. But he, uh, he wrote a book after he did six years of research. He surveyed more than 15,000 people. He wanted to know how they grew in spiritual maturity. The research showed that people are transformed through a combination of experiences, knowledge, and relationships. And the absence of any one of those three can inhibit a person's growth. And so he comes up with this journey of a transformation journey. And I want to just map it out for you real quick. There's 10 stops on this journey of uh, spiritual maturity. He calls them stops simply because... They're like mile markers along the way, but he also calls them stops because many times people just stop at a spot and they get comfortable and they stay there. Let, let me give you these real quick. They're illustrative more than anything. Uh, stop one is the ignorance, and the ignorance of the concept of sin. There are people out there that are ignorant when it comes to sin. They just, they don't know what sin is. They don't know that they have sinned. They're just, they, they just don't know. And that is the first step. Now, most people are aware that there's sin. I mean, you can look in the world today. We got all kinds of problems. Without pointing fingers, you know what it is? It's sin, okay? And so the second stop is the awareness of and indifference to sin. This is when you realize that sin is a problem. There it is. Step two, you're aware of sin. You know it's an issue, but you're indifferent to it. Oh, you know, I'm not going to worry about that. And then step three is concerns about your personal sin, the implications of your personal sin. Now, for those of you that have been in church a long time, step, stop three is when somebody's under conviction. Okay, they're, they know what sin is, they're aware of their sin, and now they're going, man, I, I really need to realize something here. I am a sinner. I have sinned. And then stop four is confessing sins and asking Christ to be their Savior. That's the moment of salvation. That's the line that they crossed when they say, you know, I know I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And I'm, I'm asking Christ to come into my life. And so if you're saved this morning, you've at least made it to stop four. And then stop five is commitment to faith activities. That's where someone gets involved in church. And then many times it stops at five. And we're only halfway through the journey. You might say, well, what's the rest of it? Well, 
Uh, stop six is experiencing a prolonged period of spiritual discontent. Um, <clears throat> let me say it this way. Many years ago, one of the largest churches in our nation, Willow Creek in Chicago, Bill Hybels was the pastor. Thousands of people were members of this church. And when they did an internal survey, there was a lot of dissatisfaction. And they thought, why? And so they spent a whole lot of money. They utilized a whole bunch of experts. They did all this research. And they came out with what they called the reveal study. And it revealed what was really going on. A lot of people were active in their church, but they were not growing in their faith. Thus, the difference between spiritual maturity, which is an inside job, and church commitment, which is something you can see with your eyes when people show up every single week. Two different things. And so, here, step six, a prolonged, prolonged period of spiritual discontent, I would describe that as this way. It's when we replace obedience to Christ with activity in the church. Let that sink in. It's when we replace obedience to Christ with activity in the church. We tell ourselves, well, I go to church every week. I read my Bible every week. I pray. I give. I do this. What does it matter if I'm thinking this? What does it matter if I'm holding something in my heart towards somebody? What does it matter if I have this secret sin? I'm okay because I'm busy. I, I, I'm involved. And that to me, is what creates this spiritual discontent. And then stop seven is experiencing personal brokenness. Now, again, this is almost like a spiral. It's just going deeper into a core of reality here. When you uh, experience brokenness, you're not getting saved again. We're not talking about some kind of second experience or anything like that. Really what we're talking about is once we get saved, everything's so fresh, everything's so new, that when we begin to stumble and kind of mess all that up, then it's kind of disheartening. And then we kind of set our expectations. Well, I'm just going to go to church and blend in, and I'm going to just do this, and I'm going to be a good Christian. And we kind of settle for less than God's best in our lives, and we learn the Christian language, and we learn how to act in church, and we just kind of fill the part. We follow the role. And here it's showing where God is really wanting to do this deep change and transformation in our lives. And so it requires personal brokenness. Uh, I would describe it this way. We've sung a lot of wonderful hymns this morning. One of them that comes to mind, I need thee every hour. Do you remember that one? I need thee every hour. It's one thing for me to say, Lord, I need you because I am a sinner and I need to be saved. That's awesome. But when you begin to realize, Lord, I need you every moment. I need you every minute. I need you every hour and that is what leads to stop eight. And stop eight is choosing to surrender and submit fully to God. And he describes it as radical dependence. You know, when you grow in maturity in this world, we look at it and say, man, they're very independent. You know, they're responsible. They get up every day. They have a job. They pay their bills. They're, they're so responsible. Look at this person. They're very independent. They're not dependent on anybody. They get up. They get moving. They get going. They take care of themselves. They even take care of others. Independence can be good when we look at someone's maturity. They, they grow up. They leave the home. They have their own job. And now they become you know, financially independent and so on and so forth. But, but spiritually speaking, independence is not good. Because I need Jesus. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the sooner I learn to depend on Him every moment and every minute of every day, the better off I am. And so you can see there at stop eight, go back to stop five. Stop five, you're involved in church, and that's great. But if you stop there, then you're missing out on that radical dependence on the Holy Spirit in stop eight. 
And then stop nine is enjoying this profound intimacy uh, with God and having this love for God that's, that's really, you know, it, it's, it's more than just religious obligation. It's a, it's a heart desire to obey God in, in all things all the time. And then the tenth stop is experiencing a profound compassion and love for humanity. Now, what does that mean? That means when you get to stop 10, you love God and you love people simply because you see the world the way God does. The way God does. And yet we settle for, well, I'm saved and I come to church and I'm going to sit here and listen to Brother Corey and I'm going to go right back out and do what I do, man. I'll see you next week. Now, I'm not saying this to insult you or anything, but I'm just saying that George Barna has been studying American Christianity for decades. And when he looks at this idea of spiritual maturity, that's the journey of transformation that he has documented. And basically what he challenges everyone to do is say, where are you? On that journey, where are you? Stop 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. That is a question that I want you to think about this morning. And when it comes to spiritual growth and maturity, how do you define it? Well, my favorite definition from one of my favorite preachers, Tony Evans, is this. Tony Evans says, spiritual growth, and I would also add maturity, is more of Christ being expressed in my life through less of me. Isn't that good? More of Christ expressed in my life through less of me. It reminds me of John the Baptist when he came on the scene. And his, his role, his call from God was to prepare the way of the Lord. And everybody came out and said, are you the one? He goes, nope, I'm not the one, but he's coming behind me and I'm not worthy. You know, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And so J John the Baptist said in John 3.30, he must increase, referring to Jesus, but I must decrease. That's what spiritual maturity at its core is. It's saying, you know, I know the Lord and I love the Lord and I want people to see Christ in my life. So he's got to increase and I have got to decrease. And so to, this morning I want to invite you to consider, are you ready to grow in spiritual maturity? We're going to look briefly at Ephesians 4 this morning. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Uh, Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. And two weeks ago, I explained that by saying that ministry is the pathway to maturity. You don't get saved and sit in the pew and stay there for years and suddenly become mature. And someday we go, hey, I need some help. Can you help me? That's not how it works. Uh, you get saved and you realize I've been saved not to live for myself, but to live for Jesus Christ. Lord, what do you want me to do? And you begin to serve him each and every day and as you serve the Lord each and every day you grow up in your faith you grow up in your knowledge of him and you become more spiritually mature ministry is the pathway to maturity but then look at what it says there in verse 14 then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching by human cunning, with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is, who is the head, and that's Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Now there's a mouthful there, but let's look at it. Why is spiritual maturity important? The answer is in verse 14, because then we're no longer little children. We're not tossed around by the waves or the wind of every teaching that comes along, by the human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. 
I hope you realize now more than ever that we have to filter everything we see and hear. We have to ask ourselves, is that true? Is it biblical? You know, is it right? Is it real? And uh, here we realize that as children of God, we have God's word. We have God's truth. And we can stand on his truth. We can stand on this knowledge of the truth and not be tossed by the wind and the waves of all kinds of stuff. We go out into the world and we hear all kinds of things. But if we want to be rooted, if we want to be grounded, we've got to go back to God's word. I always love the example of the Berean believers in Acts 17. Uh, it was a community called Berea. And I'm not talking about Berea, Kentucky. But the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, they were eager to hear the word of God. They wanted to hear the word of God. But when they heard it, and it doesn't matter who was preaching or teaching, when they heard it, they examined the scriptures to see whether or not this person speaking God's word was telling it right. And that's exactly what you and I need to do. We need to be grounded in the Word of God so that we can grow up in our salvation and not be little children that are tossed by the wind and the waves of false teaching. That's why spiritual maturity is important. So how do we grow in spiritual maturity? Look in verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, and that is Christ. Now, I will flesh this out a little bit more in a couple of minutes, but that's the key, speaking the truth in love. It involves God's Word. It involves other people, God's people, and it involves the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then, what does spiritual maturity look like? There in verse 16, From Him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. In other words, spiritual maturity, what does it look like? When everybody is pursuing Christ, more of Him, less of ourselves, then we become the people that, is, that, that God has called us to be. We become this body that is growing. Everybody knows their role, everybody knows their part, everybody's doing their part, and they're building each other up in love. That's what it looks like. So the question is, are we ready to grow in maturity? I want to show you how this morning, going back to that verse, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, that is Christ. Okay, three things we can do this morning. Number one, put God's Word into practice. Put God's Word into practice. Um, you know, Going back to the Great Commission, we have to learn to obey everything that He's commanded us. And that takes a lifetime. And so you and I have got to put God's Word into practice. That, that's what the speaking the truth in love is all about. Before we can share the truth with others, we've got to experience the power of it ourselves. And we've got to put it into practice so that we have something to say. We're not just talking from a book, but we're talking from experience. And so put God's Word into practice. When we begin to put God's Word into practice then that radically changes our life. You know, the funny thing is that reveal study that I mentioned a few minutes ago that Willow Creek did years ago, they paid thousands of dollars for all this information. And you know what the number one thing they learned was? Do you know what the number one predictor of spiritual growth is? Their study can tell you. The answer, daily Bible reading. How about that? All that money to be told, did you read your Bible today? Well, that is the number one predictor of spiritual growth and maturity. When you take a, uh, some time every day to just read God's Word. Now, I'm not talking study. I'm not talking about, you know, getting out your Bible and then you read it and then you go over here and you pull this little book out and you pull this book out and you start digging and researching. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just daily reading the Bible, period, and letting God's Word speak to you in all of its truthfulness and purity. That is the key. And when we read the Word of God, 
it will read us and then we have to put it into practice um, and that's why it's so important to put God's word into practice don't just be a hearer of the word but be a doer of the word another way that we grow in maturity uh, we put God's word into practice and then number two join a group where you can be challenged and encouraged now I call it a D group but join a group where you can be challenged and encouraged. Because see, right here, he says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. you got to be in relationship to do that. You can't just do that on your own. Speaking the truth in love means there's people involved. And there's a relationship there. And you need them and they need you. That's what the church is all about. We are a family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a body. We belong to him and to one another. And we have to speak truth in love to one another. Isn't it always good when you have those moments where you go to someone that you love and maybe there's been something brewing, something going on, but when you finally clear the air, when you finally say, hey, do you mind if we, we talk? And you just put everything out there. And because of the relationship, there's no harm, no, no foul. There's no hard feelings. It's just putting everything on the table and looking at what it is as it really is. That's what you and I need. That's what speaking the truth in love is all about. And we need to join together and do that. You and I... We grow in community. When you look at this passage of Scripture in Ephesians 4, we grow in the context of the body. We're connected to Christ. We're connected to one another. We're interdependent. We need one another. And so I would encourage you that if you don't have a, 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 um, a relationship with two or three other Christians that you get together with regularly, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, let it be organic. Just say, God, I need this. God, I want this. And begin to pray for it. Begin to look for it and begin to pursue it. Uh, call somebody up on the phone. Ha take them out to lunch and say, you know, I, I've been a Christian for a while or, or whatever the case may be, but I've never really been intentional, you know, like a plan, like a purpose, like a process. And I really want to do this, but I, I don't want to do it by myself. Are you interested in this? What do you think? And when you get two or three people that are interested, then you've got the opportunity to do this together. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And so the third and final thing, how do you grow in maturity? You put God's word into practice. That's the truth part. You join a D group where you can be challenged and encouraged. That's the speaking the truth and love part. And then you discover, number three, how you can serve as an active part of the body of Christ. Serve as an active part of the body of Christ. God has not called you and I to just come here once a week and sit on the sidelines. He wants to use you um, as a servant in this body, as a witness in the world. He wants you to wake up every day and say, you know, Lord, I've lived my life for me, but now I want to live it for you. Lord, what do you want me to do today? And ask him that question. Make that your prayer and then get your marching orders from the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we, be, when we begin to actively serve, then we get going. And can I tell you something? When we get going, that's when we get growing. Many people think that growth is a sit still while I end still proposition. But there's a problem with that. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you never get around to applying it, what good is it? What good is it? That's why Jesus closed his sermon with the best invitation ever in Matthew 7. He says, he who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise man. He's a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the storms came, when the wind blew, when the water rose, guess what? It stood. But if you hear these words of mine and you don't put them into practice, then that's foolish. And the foolish man built his house on sand. And when the storms came and the wind blow and the water rose, guess what? That house was washed away. 
you and I have a choice and we have a responsibility. What are we going to do with God's word in our lives? Are we going to do, are we just going to hear it and go, yep, mm -hmm, yeah, that's good, that's all right? Or are we going to put it into practice? Are we going to get in a relationship with other believers where we can be challenged and encouraged and they begin to serve and do our part, whatever God wants us to do in the world and in the church? If we will do that, we will get going. And if we get going, we will grow in spiritual maturity. As we prepare for this next year, I'm prayerfully praying right now that we'll have some D groups that will start. And it's not a programmatic thing. It's, it's a call to every one of y'all to say, hey, pray that God will give you two or three people that you can go to and say, hey, you know, I want to be more intentional about my walk with Christ. I, want to, I need encouragement, and sometimes I need to be challenged, but I can't do that on my own. I need to do that in the context of trust and transparency and community. And you prayerfully go to two or three people Guys, go to two or three men. Gals, go to two or three women. And when you have your group, we'll have stuff ready for you to use. It's not a teacher thing. It's not a class thing. It's not a Bible study thing. It's a series of conversations that will give you some material to so, kind of get the, the, the table set and the conversation ready. And all you got to do is show up and have these conversations centered around God's Word and around your life so that you can be encouraged, so that you can be challenged, so that you can grow in your walk with Christ. I want to encourage you today to take that first step, to start praying about it. Start, start realizing, you know, where am I on this journey of 1 through 10 that we showed a while ago? And where are you? And if you've took the step of already coming to Christ and getting involved in church... I hope you realize there's still a whole lot of steps left. Not that I'm trying to make it hard. Not that I'm trying to make it difficult. But even George Barna says, if you really want to be changed by Christ, if you want to be transformed, realize the map. There's a map. There's a journey that you go through. There's a process. I think we've got to stop buying into the menu mentality. Hey, pastor, I want to grow. What should I do? Well, we got this, 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 and this. Well, what should I do? Well, try them all. They're all good. Or we could have a map. And when you learn what the map is, you know exactly where you are. And you know exactly where you're headed. And now that you know where you are and where you're going, you know how to get there. And that's my prayer today. <clears throat> so today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ... That's your first big step of realizing that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And you say, Lord, come into my life, save me, I'm yours. And you trust and follow Him. If you've already done that, then I cannot encourage you enough to look at your own experience as a Christian and in, in church and just ask yourself this question. Do I have two or three people that I can call in the middle of the night if I really needed to. And if not, I want to encourage you right now to begin praying that God will give you those two or three people. And then approach them one-on-one -on -one personal invitation and say, man, I really want to be more focused and intentional about growing in my Christian life. But I can't do this on my own. And I was wondering if you might be interested in getting together ever so often. And we'll have some conversations centered around God's Word and how to actually live that out in our lives. I challenge you and encourage you to pray about that. Let's all stand as the musicians come. We're going to have a time of response. This is our invitation. And it's my prayer that you'll do exactly what God wants you to do as we pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, most of all, thank you for Jesus. Father, I pray for your will to be done in our lives. Lord, every single one of us is on a journey. And Lord, that journey is going to end someday when we stand before you. 
And Lord, it's my prayer that none of us will be unprepared for that day when we have that moment of truth. Father, I pray if there's someone here today that's never took that first step of faith, I pray that they would do it before it's too late. And Lord, I pray for every believer in our midst today. Lord, if they've been struggling with obeying you and they've been settling for just involvement in the church, Lord, I pray that you would get down to the heart of the matter and show them, Lord, how deep you want to change us. Lord, show them the work of the Holy Spirit that's possible when we radically depend on you every moment of every day. And Lord, have your will and your way in each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life. Good to see everyone here today. We hope you can join us uh, in another hour at Shopful Park. We'll have a good time of food, fun, and fellowship. And the lunches will be self-contained. You don't have to bring anything but yourself and a smile, right? All right. God bless you. And uh, I want to ask Brad Hewitt if he would dismiss us in prayer, brother.